We're sailing the high seas in the tall ships with Captain Horatio Hornblower. This is episode four. You're listening to 70s Trek with Bob Turner and Kelly Casco. The fan podcast that looks at Star Trek in the 1970s. It was the decade that built a franchise. Welcome to 70s Trek, the show that looks at all things Star Trek in the 70s. I'm Bob Turner. And I'm Kelly Casto. This episode, we look at Captain Horatio Hornblower. This character was one of the key influences of Star Trek and Captain James T. Kirk. Yeah. And some other things in this series. Absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing how much um, Hornblower and Trek are similar. Before we dive into that, though, let me ask you this. Do you have any questions or comments? Any ideas for episodes? You know, reach out to us. We'd like to keep an open relationship going with listeners and ourselves. It's easy. You know, you can find us at Facebook. Our, our page is facebook.com slash 70s Trek, and that is 70s. Zero S Trek. You know, the series was originally pitched to NBC by Gene Roddenberry as Wagon Train to the Stars. Kelly, you used to watch Rat Wagon Train, right? You, you kind of know about that show. Giddy up. Yeah. That was a little before my time, too. And Just I'm an a old, little. I'm an old feller. But one of the other pitches that Roddenberry made was Captain Horatio Hornblower in space. And it probably was that later description that really sort of summed up what the show became, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, William Shatner, when he, he tells a story about meeting Gene to talk about Kirk, the character. And, and um, this, you know, after he was cast for it. So they sat down and they ate. They were talking um, a little bit and telling stories. Uh, when Gene was getting ready to leave, Shatner said, hey, shouldn't we talk about the character? Roddenberry replies, Read the Horatio Hornblower <laughs> books. It's all in there. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, go read these books. It's all there. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Hornblower was a, a fictional character, for those who don't know, in a series of uh, 17 books uh, written by C.S. Forrester. They're, they're really, really cool. They were first published, and I didn't know this until we did a little research here, the first book was published in 1937, and the last one was in 1967. So there's 30 years of, of uh, publishing going on for these books. Very interesting. Um, the books follow the career of a British sea officer, Horatio Hornblower, from the time that he was a midshipman through his career in the Napoleonic Wars against France and eventually when he becomes an admiral. So he rises through the ranks. And the character of Hornblower, what I thought was really cool, was he was somebody who was not connected to any type of royalty. He was a commoner, but he rose through the ranks to become an officer because he had the wherewithal. He had the personal characteristics. You know, he was a strong personality. He was smart. He had guile. And um, he was a strong character who was able to do it on his own, which I thought was pretty cool. And, and it also sums up Kirk, I think, really, really well. Sure does. Um, so this week we're going to talk about one of the interpretations of the character. So probably the one closest to Kirk. Uh, if you look at the movie um, with Gregory Peck, Captain Horatio Hornblower, uh, made in 1951. Um, you, you know, we'll just talk about that and see yeah. how the differences and similarities. Absolutely. Um, and, and you know what, Kelly? I, I watched the movie here recently, and from the opening scene and the opening music, it sounds like Star Trek. 
at the very <laughs> beginning of the movie, you hear, da, da, da. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> Now the music goes on and it takes a different theme, but every once in a while you hear that da da da, and I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me! You know, it can't be a coincidence. I, I'm sure it's not. No, I'm sure it's not either. I, you, you know, the movie starts off and they really kind of lay out very well what's happening. The ship is called the Lydia, and it is 201 days out from England. And 10,000 miles away from home. And they're on a secret mission. Very cool. They're on a secret mission. And um, tell, me, tell me what you thought about Hornblower in those opening scenes. Well, I mean, one of the opening scenes is, you know, he's keeping the discipline with his, um, with his crew. And, but, you know, actually it was one of his officers that, you know, said something. You know, like uh, he's going to lash them if they don't do whatever. And he's like, well, if you're going to threaten somebody, you got to carry it through. And I have to support that to maintain control of the ship. It was I thought that, you know, maybe not a Kirk X thing, but it was um, that was interesting. I thought I, I agree with you. Yeah. You know, he's letting that officer know, hey, look, I, I wouldn't have done this. But since you spoke up. I have to support you. But, but it's what he said after that then. He says, you know, flogging only makes a bad man worse, and it can break a good man's spirit. You know, Hornblower is obviously, he's a young captain. I mean, he looks like he's in his 30s. He looks like he's Kirk's age, but he is wise beyond his years. Wise, he is wise beyond his years. He's got some wisdom there, and he's teaching it to his younger officer. I thought that was very cool. Absolutely. <laughs> and how, how about the can, the cranky doctor? <laughs> oh, yeah. yes. The, yes, he didn't last long, though. No, no, he didn't. But the cranky doctor, I'm like watching that going, oh, my God. Is that who Bones was chattered after? <laughs> and, and while he doesn't ever say the words, uh, you know, narrate the words Captain's Log, the movie shifts to the captain's log visually so the viewer gets the, a, a sense of what's happening and moves the story along so that that um, cinematic device obviously was carried over to the TV show it's just that Shatner spoke the words rather than us reading the log I did not catch that I'm happy to deliver a little bit there you know I also thought it was cool that this character is unflappable you know he's calm as we discover, they've been at sea for 200 days. This crew is worn out and they're tired and they, they're about to, you know, it looks like they have scurvy or the early stages of scurvy and, and they're all on edge waiting to find land. And when they see land, the whole crew is excited and, and he's calmly eating lunch. He's, you know, I'll get there. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get there. Just let me finish my lunch. I'll get there. And I just thought that was kind of Kirk-like, you know? Very calm. He's, yep. he's amused. I don't know if you caught this, when that young officer comes bursting into his cabin and he's telling, oh, Captain, we've seen land. And he's like, all right, I'm going to finish eating lunch, you know? <laughs> and oh, by the way, don't burst into my cabin next time. And be careful as you leave here. You might want to walk. And there's a little grin on his face. He's kind of amused at this guy's excitement. Yep. That, to me, was very Kirk-like. He kind of, you know, he was just kind of looking at the guy like, oh, I get it. I, I understand you're excited, you know. Always with the discipline, though. Oh, always. So did you happen to notice, Kelly, the makeup on the Spaniards? Oh, yes. Did it remind oh, yes. you of anybody? Huh. Let's see. Maybe Klingons? Maybe Klingons? <laughs> Can you say Klingons? Okay, that's a call back to the church lady. A very bad yeah. one. Yeah, seriously, the dark hair, the, the mustaches and goatees, the very dark uh, uh, complexion, the eyebrows. That's the makeup of the Klingons in the original series. <laughs> yep, El Supremo El could have been a Klingon. El Supremo. <laughs> I love that. By the way, 
now refer to me as El Supremo. El Su- I'm sorry, El Supremo. Of course I will. Yeah, that character was funny that he took himself so seriously. <laughs> and everybody else did, too. Exactly. Exactly. I thought it was very cool, too. Very a Kirk-like moment because we've seen Kirk do this. He's in the Spanish fort. Um, El Supremo is telling him, you will do this and this and this for me. And, and Hornblower says, okay, but what about my provisions? Now, nope, you're just going to do what I want. And he says, okay, you need to know that if the ship doesn't hear from me in an hour, they're going to unload on your fort and blow it up. And El Supremo says, but you're here. And he says, yeah, that's right. I'm here, and I'm willing to go down with it, too. And yep. I thought, ooh. Every contingency. Yes. He's got it covered. And he, he might be bluffing, but he's willing to lay that bluff out there. I'm willing to go down. Because we've seen Kirk say that before. You oh, know, fire phase is on this location. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. How about, um, how about the mission to capture the Spanish ship Natividad? Who leads that mission? That was Kirk. I mean, uh, Hornblower. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Good stuff. What else? What do you have in your notes after that? Uh, well, so doing a little research and, and reading up on this, um, if you look at the Wrath of Khan and this movie, there are a lot of similarities. Oh, boy, aren't there? I mean, the, the battle, that, that um, battle between the Natividad um was very similar to that Kirk and Khan uh, ship battle. Yeah, there's some guile there. Um, as the two ships are heading toward each other, the um, the Lydia, Hornblower's ship, is on the left. The Natividad is on the right. And Hornblower quickly cuts across the bow. And he cuts across the bow to the side of the Natividad that the ship is leaning and its gun points are in the water. And Hornblower quickly quickly takes um, uh, advantage of that fact and is able to really uh, damage the Natividad, which is a bigger ship with more guns. Right. Very similar to the three-dimension versus two-dimensional thinking. Yes. Yeah. Yes, in, uh, in Wrath of Khan. And I think I read something somewhere, and now that you bring this up, where Nicholas Meyer had said, look, I, you know, I looked at Star Trek. I looked at the Enterprise, and I saw them as a crew fighting the Napoleonic Wars. I saw them as this ship doing this kind of thing. So clearly, I mean, Meyer saw that connection too. Whether or not he had talked with Roddenberry or not, I don't know. But he tended to, um, he included that militaristic uh, form over top of what Star Trek was, much more than it probably was in the series uh boy did it work too oh yeah yep actually if you listen to the audio commentary on the wrath of khan on the director's edition he taught uh, myers talks about that there you go you've got it down yeah so so more similarities i got lots of notes here when go buddy go lots. so um first off let, let me give a nod to this website um so if you want to s- see the the differences between Wrath of Khan and Horatio Hornblower, the um, search for he had a hat. He on, I'm sorry, he had on a hat. He had there's, on a hat. Yes, there's a video that does a like a side by side comparison, and so you see the battle, uh, the ship battle. You this as you were talking about earlier, the music. Oh, there's the awesome. same kind of dramatic mu- music, almost right on um on par with each other there's also the midshipman longley on hornblower when he's dying that's very similar to the midshipman preston dying uh in um wrath of Khan. and meyer is a great storyteller i i think he is an underrated director i really really do um and so i'm not surprised that those ties are there and look how well they work in Wrath of Khan, you know, when you compare it to this movie. And, and we are getting a little ahead of ourselves by talking about Wrath of Khan, but that's okay. It's all good. Did you see, or did you notice, 
who the Spanish captain of the Natividad was? No. Who was it? Christopher Lee. Oh. Famous actor Christopher Lee. You really got a name for playing um, Dracula and some horror movies later on. But Christopher Lee has been around for decades, over 50 years. In this movie, he's playing the Spanish captain. Very cool. I totally missed that. Very, very cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I was checking out the credits at the end of the movie. You know, the other thing I liked about this, too, was um, the, the uh, Lydia. It's, it's far from home. It's not able to communicate with its base. And granted, that's, you know, part of the technology, communication technology of, of that time. Uh, in the early, early 1800s. But that's what the Enterprise does in the show, too. It is far from home. So our captain, Captain Kirk, has to make decisions based on his experience and his intuition, which is exactly what Hornblower does as well. Right. No connection to the home base. Has to, you know, improvise and yeah, deal I mean, with the situation. Exactly. And he is a superior tactician. He, he, uh, he is able to bring all of that to bear when, when he's in a situation where he needs to create a plan and needs to put it into action. You can tell Hornblower is a smart guy for, for being a young man, much like Captain Kirk. And he's a really good tactician. He understands tactics in battles and knows how to make them work for him. Now, how is he different from Captain Kirk? There's one major way. I mean, hmm. He is totally uncomfortable around women. Oh, yes. Uh, and, and Gregory Peck does just this, this great job in the movie. Um, when he is uncomfortable with something, Gregory Peck will, will do... <laughs> <laughs> um, kind yeah. Of yeah. Clear his throat. <laughs> <laughs> and how about, I love this scene later on in the movie when he does begin to get to know... Um, the character's name is uh, Lady Barbara. As he gets to know Lady Barbara later, and she teases him about how he clears his throat, and he says, oh, you're pretty <laughs> observant. Nobody's ever noticed that before. <laughs> yeah, we all have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He just didn't know anybody noticed. That's right. That's right. So that that's a, a really cool love story that weaves through the movie that I thought was really, really well done. Um. But yeah, he's a little uncomfortable with having women on his ship. He's very uncomfortable with having the ship's routine disturbed. You know, and you can see Kirk yeah. having those uh, similar similar feelings. So, so not to disrupt the flow of this conversation with Kirk. Sure, go ahead. But didn't that didn't Hornblower also remind you of another Star Trek captain? Who are you thinking of? Picard. So, <sighs> see, I've been so focused on the uh, Kirk comparison that I didn't even think about that. So, Rodden, yeah, Roddenberry even said that Picard was actually modeled after the Gregory Peck Horatio Hornblower. Because there are moments, at least early on, there are yes. moments when Picard went. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uncomfortable with, you know, personal situations. Liked everything nice and tidy, like you said, in order. So nice. So just just something to think about. So I think that um, as we talk about this movie and how it is an influence on Star Trek, there you go. There's Roddenberry even coming right out and saying, "Yes, you know, in, in fact, it influenced me so much, I patterned two captains after him." Exactly. Here is a, a line that I thought was really cool. You know, he had uh, told. Uh, one of his officers, Mr. Gerard, earlier in the movie that, hey, we need to get faster at response times. We need to clear the deck faster. I need you to have your men ready to go much quicker. So after a key battle then later on in the movie, and after the battle is over, he goes up to uh, this officer and he says, Mr. Gerard, I told you to clear the decks for action in 10 minutes. Pause. You did it in eight. Mm -hmm. And he has a little grin on his face. Is that yeah. Kirk-like or what? That, that that was Kirk, all over. It really was. As you it, as you watch this movie, if you're familiar with the original series at all, you see these 
it's like a mirror image of Kirk shine through, through Peck's portrayal and through the character, who the character was. I thought that was great. Well, even some of the, like you said earlier, the mechanics of, of um, the show. I mean, you know, Horatio Warnblower going out on, you know, away missions, yeah. if you will. Yeah. I, I thought this was neat, too. There was a point in the story where he's been told by the Admiral, don't operate on your own. But then circumstances present an opportunity. And, his, uh, uh, and he decides, look, I'm going to have to go after these, these four um, French ships. And his officer says, you know, the admiral's going to get you for this. He told you not to operate on your own. And Hornblower says, I'd rather be court-martialed than let those sh- four ships go. Again, you can hear Kirk saying something similar to that. We have to stop this. Those admirals, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. I have to go out there and I have to take care of this business. It's more important. I'd rather be court-martialed than not do it. You can hear Kirk saying something like that. Yep. I mean, he takes an impossible situation and finds a way to survive. Yeah, very much so. And then and of course, he also loses his ship. Yes, and how? Talk about that. He um, he blow he basically blows it up to block the... Um, the bay. Yeah, he orders his ship to self-destruct. Exactly. Again, that's a, a, that is a Kirk move. We've seen the threat in the original series. We know it happens later on as fans. So that again, that's a very Kirk-like maneuver too. You you don't see a way out. Your ship is is wounded. Most guys would say, okay, this is the point where we throw up our hands and we say we give up, we surrender. Not these captains. Nope, I'm going to take defeat, and I'm going to turn it into victory. Very cool. So as the, as the story moves on, there was a couple other things that I really liked. Um, I like the fact that he is caring for the wounded while the ship is sinking. You know, I thought that was a Kirk-like move, too. He's making sure that everybody is taken care of. I think he, the line is something like, you know, uh, lash the wounded men. He's, he's giving orders, bam, 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 bam. And then he says, lash the wounded men to something that floats and make sure they're okay. You know, the fact that he's thinking about the men puts them first. Everybody first. And then later in the movie, they steal that French ship. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the audacious way that they do it. You know, they knock a couple of guys out. They steal some uniforms. They just walk onto the deck. <laughs> they walk downstairs into a meeting <laughs> <laughs> of French officers as they're planning their next move. Holy cow, are you kidding me? And then they capture the ship. And then they go up on deck and they hear, um, they heard captured British officers. And, and I thought this was great. You know, the one captured British officer is, is speaking in English that the French can't understand. And he says something like, I'd like to push them over the side, you know. And Hornblower then turns to him and says, well, I thought you wanted to push them over the side. Let's go. <laughs> Very bold move. Ballsy. Hornblower is ballsy. And Kirk has done similar things to that, like beaming aboard the, the Romulan ship in the Enterprise incident, dressed as a Romulan. Yeah ballsy stuff stuff that takes you know lots of courage and guts what else do you have kelly what else did you notice i think you hit the end of my list (laughs) fun stuff this was really really cool movie i'm i'm uh i would uh i would suggest that any fan of star trek watch this movie you'll love the similarities i think it just uh, they just jump out at you absolutely and uh and then you know outside of the movie look at the whole franchise there is hornblower peppered throughout yep yep you can see the influence and I mean, um go ahead so even on ds9 not now we're getting ahead of ourselves again but uh that's one of cisco's favorite authors he's there's three references at least there are there really yes he's he's um in two instances he's reading hornblower um I think it's the visitor and the muse. And then he's reading 
it to his dad in a flashback scene, I think it is, for the cause. How about that? Completely over my head. That one I never caught. Nice. I don't know about you, Kelly, but you know what? I think we nailed this. I would agree. Thanks for listening this week. You know, next week we're going to take a tour of the future when we take a look at the new movie, Star Trek Beyond. We hope you'll join us. See you then. Thanks for listening to 70s Trek, an independent fan production. Join us next week as we explore more about the production, the actors, the producers, and the influencers of Star Trek in the lost decade of the 1970s on 70s Trek. 